Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joshua Ginsberg. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at We Are The Medicine, uh, hosted by Seek Healing, an Asheville, North Carolina-based nonprofit working to reduce drug overdoses and deaths of despair associated with the loneliness epidemic. Um, this is our spring fundraiser, so we invite you to make a donation to our organization. Uh, you can do so by texting Seek Healing, that's S-E-E-K-H-E-A-L-I-N-G, to 44321. Or if you go to the event website, uh, you can click on the donate button on that event page. Um, and all the donations today will be used to fund our extra care program, which uh, assists those most at risk using the methods of authentic human connection this festival is showcasing. Uh, if you go to the event website, you can also find our silent auction. We have a number of items that are physical items that can be shipped anywhere in the world and local services that are uh, here in Asheville, North Carolina. But uh, if you get some uh, time today, feel free to go over there, take a look and see what's available. And again, all of that goes to benefit the extra care program for Seek Healing. Um, and so our speaker is uh, described as an instigator, a ninja and a turtle, uh, according to her bio. Um, she is also a beloved authentic relating facilitator who has trained and coached thousands of people from all over the world and all walks of life. Uh, she's about to get real with us for the next two hours. So uh, please give a wholehearted welcome to Sarah Ness of Authentic Revolution. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah and I'm going to have a little co-facilitator with me here today because I know that sometimes just staring at somebody's screen for an hour can be kind of boring. So I figured I'd provide some entertainment. Um, so I'm going to be giving a talk and then doing a workshop on loneliness and connection, which is a pretty broad topic. So I've gotten to think a little bit about what is that and what are the different sides of it? And and how is loneliness maybe not the other side of connection? So I'm going to start out with a question and a poem that came to me last night when I was contemplating it, which I'm kind of shaking because it feels really vulnerable to do poems. So the contemplation. When was the last time you felt lonely? When was the last time you were solo in a crowd, heart loud, voice soft, lost in words still undiscerned? Come find me. Remind me that you too are a person who cares. I swear that if I break this shell, I'll tell you what's spelled on the inside, flesh and bone hiding joys and woes. You'll never know if I can't make it out of here. If I'm stuck in fear, struck dumb by the mere thought of what you think of me, shrinking me, I shouldn't care but I'm stripped bare by the memory of moments unrepaired. I was born to believe sincerity and recently it's scaring me because being who I am damns me to who I will be. My voice is the only tool I choose and sometimes I lose it. Come find me. So during this talk, I have a question that I'd love you to reflect on and maybe answer in chat if you feel like it, um, which is, when is it that you feel lonely? And the inspiration for this talk is that despite the fact that I'm a teacher of connection, I'm probably one of the people that has spread authentic relating, which is my practice most in the world by writing the source text and doing trainings for it. Um, I find connection to be a really difficult thing to achieve. And the reason is because I have pretty severe social anxiety. And so I have a constant experience of showing up in a crowd of people, knowing that I have the skills to connect and not, and just freezing, going small, not wanting to change things, not wanting to interrupt. And oftentimes just finding myself checking out of the party early or having to find something to do with my hands for hours to feel comfortable. And so I've been contemplating this question of how is it possible to feel lonely in a crowd? If we think of connection as the antidote to loneliness, then being around other people should have us feel less lonely. But I think for a lot of us, that's not fully the case. And I'll put the poem in chat. I saw the, the request for that. Um, 
So I'm hearing some of these people feel lonely in crowds a lot of the time when you can't show your face, when you've asked for connection and been misunderstood always in the middle of the night. Yeah, all of these. Um, I think that there's, so what I'm gonna do in this talk is talk about a couple of reasons that I think loneliness occurs and then uh, just some of what we can do about it. And I'm hoping to make this pretty practical for what happens when you get into social situations or you're in places where you feel lonely and really want to feel understood or contacted, which feels especially poignant to me in the middle of this pandemic when it feels like uh, connections matter more than ever because we're dealing with a, with a dearth of them. And for an organization like Seek Healing, where I imagine a lot of the people coming feel maybe pretty misunderstood or like they don't have the amount of connection that they crave. I know one of the missions of, or one of the precepts of Seek Healing is that um, really deep authentic connection can be a salve for, for seekers and those who are dealing with addiction, which I think all of us are in one way or another. I certainly have addictions to Facebook and fantasy novels and many other things. Um, so I think there's a couple reasons that I can think of that people experience loneliness uh, of the sort that y'all are talking about um, in chat. Um, so one is that people don't share your experiences. You're around a whole bunch of other folks and um, for instance, like imagine being uh, a mother in a crowd of people, this happens a lot in my community, somebody with kids in a crowd of people that don't have them who are pretty young and don't have to deal with getting childcare if they're going to come to an event um, or dealing with, you know, family issues. Uh, or if you're someone that's coming out of a, a really difficult childhood situation around people that don't have trauma, there's a certain, uh, I think, feeling of isolation to other people not understanding the circumstances that you're in. Um, I think this is a big thing in Black Lives Matter right now as well, of Black people feeling like they have to teach white people what their experience is. Another one is people don't share your values. So maybe they have the same experiences, but they feel differently about them. This shows up a lot in family. Maybe we grew up with the same people in our family, but we're Democrats and they're Republicans, or we have just incredibly different views. Um, and that can be very isolating. Another one is, I imagine some people have experienced this, people do share your experiences. But when you talk to them, they try to stand outside of you and fix their own pain rather than being with yours. This happens often if, if I share a really vulnerable experience and someone's response to it is like, oh, I've been through that, here's what to do. And I think this often comes from it being really difficult to be in contact with someone else's hurt and stay with it. It's actually painful to, to be that and do that. Um, another one is there are no people. This is sometimes a reason for loneliness. Uh, and the last one that I can think of, and feel free to put others in chat if, if you have others you wanna share, um, there are people, but you don't know how to connect with them. So maybe you even share the same values or some of the similar experiences, but their mode of communication is really different or they're in a different subculture or there's something going on inside of you. Like for me, I have really, when I get into an anxiety attack, I find it really hard to connect with other people, even if I think I should be able to. Sometimes if I host potlucks at my house, I have to be in the kitchen cooking for the first two hours because I can't make myself connect with others. Um, and I think different subcultures have really different languages almost. If you listen to the words that people use to communicate, uh, the terms that they use, the nonverbal communication, whether they touch each other, um, these are all different languages. And when we integrate with someone else, we're not just coming in contact with another person, we're coming in contact with an entire world of experiences and subcultures. And that can make it difficult to connect. Um, I think this is also why, uh, why oftentimes we find it difficult, especially to connect with family and coworkers, because those are connections where we don't get to choose them. So rather than being with people that automatically share our values because we've selected for them. We're around people that have pretty different experiences than we do, and we have to learn to get along with them, which can be difficult. Um, so maybe for the purposes of this, 
um, think about if there's somebody in your life that you find it hard to connect with and why that is. And as I talk about some forms of connection, it might help to, to keep that in mind. Um, I'm also seeing a question in chat of, uh, I'm not sure what lonely means. Does anyone have a definition they would like to share? And I'll share mine and I wanna invite, if others have, have definitions, feel free to share those as well. I was actually thinking about whether to ask the question of what does loneliness mean to you? Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm actually defining it as a, a sensation, or that's how I define it for myself. Loneliness is usually a feeling of coldness and emptiness uh, in my chest. And sometimes it's surrounded by a bubble of, of kind of anxiety and I wanna get away from that feeling. Oftentimes there are thoughts of like, I should be able to connect, I feel ashamed, I have to get away. I'm seeing some in here of like, um, I recognize loneliness by how ang angry I feel. Rain in my heart. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> From the Bee Gees. Totally, that sort of feeling. So whatever it means to you. Um, so one thing uh, I've been thinking about, I had, I had a really interesting conversation with my partner um, a couple, a week or two ago, actually. And I... Uh, I was, and so I'm just going to mute you uh, for now. If I if I hear background noise coming in, um, we'll, we'll go to a workshop after this and practice some of this, uh, and then there'll be more interaction. But this is mostly just going to be me talking at the camera. Beyond which, hopefully, are all of you. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I was having a conversation with my partner a week or two ago about loneliness because he and I come from very different communities. And as we've been in quarantine, I've been interacting mostly with my housemate and his house. My housemate and I are on really similar pages. We're both really into nonviolent communication. He was an authentic relating facilitator like eight years ago when our community started here. Uh, he's a meditator. Um, we just find it really easily, easy to get along. We have a similar set of languages. My partner's community are artists and performers and um, models and people that have a really different style of communication. Um, their idea of fun is going out downtown or having a couple of drinks um, or playing cards. And I'm not, by the way, judging this at all. Um, in fact, I've mostly been judging myself for not being able to figure out how to interact with them, how to come into a social space with people that I know are human and probably want to interact, but I can't figure out how to start a conversation. And my partner asked me this really wonderful question. Um, he said, when you connect with someone else at a party or a gathering of this sort, what do you want? And I thought about it and I was like, well, most of the time I want to get away. <laughs> and I was like, oh, cool, that totally makes sense of why I'm having this reaction that's so strong of feeling like I just need to get away because secretly that's, that's what I'm creating is a desire to get away. And so one of the contemplations I'm having is how to be more aware going into situations of what it is that I desire. So if you can think of one of these places in your life that you're having trouble connecting I'm curious if you know what you want out of that connection. I think that loneliness and longing are often pretty close to each other and sometimes can even be mistaken for each other. So what is it that you're longing for from these connections? And it may or may not be possible, like maybe one of the reasons loneliness is happening is because with your family, you're longing to be understood and that desire or need is getting missed. Um, for me, if I'm longing to run away and instead what I'm getting is connection of some form, my desire is actually not getting met. And I think there's actually a couple, um, a couple different desires in there maybe. Like I'm longing to run away, but I'm also longing to have easy connection, which would come from people that share my language and values. And I saw one of the comments in chat, um, tribal circles like activist circles, creative communities like Burning Man or those who have jargon like NBC can create an exclusionary vibe. I actually argue that almost every culture has somewhat of an exclusionary vibe. 
because we have circles of connection and the most innermost ones are i think things like uh we tend to have the strongest connections with moderately insular communities that have an identity so we have a shared language or we have a shared purpose like your work or your family um, when communities get too broad to where they lose a sense of identity, like I am American, it sometimes gets hard to feel really connected because there are so many subgroups contained within that, that we don't really know what we're part of. So there's this constant struggle that I find as a community leader between how do I create identity and how do I create inclusion. So when we go to new communities or when we interact with people and we have this extremely globalized culture where we're interacting with new people all the time, we're stepping into someone else's norms and language and not really knowing how to interact. Like when I go out to a party with my partner's friends, in my community, if I say, hey, how are you? People really think about it. Like it's not a formality. It's a, uh, okay, if I ask you that question, I'm willing to spend five minutes listening to how you are. Um, there's a changing of speeds, a slowing down of pace. Um, there's a lot of curiosity and question asking. Uh, and to people from the outside, it's like, why are you psychoanalyzing each other all the time? <laughs> you know, it can look weird, but, and to people, other people, it's like, wow, there's so much safety here. So there are pluses and minuses, right? Um, and when I go into my partner's community, there's, there's a totally different vibe. And I often feel like people are being very standoffish, but I don't think it's the case. I think I feel lonely because I don't know how to interact within that language yet. And I may or may not want to, which is one thing I'm, I'm kind of trying to decide. Um, so another thing maybe to think of during this is like, what is your, what is the tribe, the tribe in which you feel comfortable and the ones in which you don't? And what are the norms and how does that influence things? Like if you go home to your family and they seem intolerant to you, what values are getting excluded there? What are they not doing that you inherently feel is wrong? But they with each other obviously have a culture in which it's normal. And in fact, like for people who are, for instance, intolerant or I see that I see as intolerant in their subculture to not act that way might get them ostracized. So a lot of the time what we're looking for is actually social security in the non-financial sense, mostly. Um, so one thing that I've been, uh, one thing I find myself doing often at parties where I don't feel comfortable is doing what I call fence post sitting. Um, which is I will sneak away from the party and I'll go and just like sit somewhere by myself for a while. And I used to think of this as I'm just running away. Like I'm uncomfortable with what's occurring. So I'm going to, you know, find someplace else. And when I was younger, um, I would really acutely feel the loneliness of wanting someone to come out and find me. And as I've grown older and I still find myself doing that behavior, I'm seeing it a little bit differently, which is that when I'm around other people, to some extent, I get subsumed in their culture and desires. And the part of me that, that feels lonely in that is the part that is paying attention to, I think, a different set of values and norms and desires. Sometimes I get into a community that fully meets those and I feel like I'm home, I'm not lonely, this is amazing. But sometimes I'm with a group of people where the part of me that feels lonely is the part that's not getting met. And me going off and sitting by myself is a form of reconnecting to that part and checking in with it. So I've been exploring this realm of what is loneliness with other people? What is loneliness with myself? Like oftentimes when I'm alone physically, I still feel lonely and other times I don't. And when I feel lonely, I've noticed that if I close my eyes and just sit with myself, sometimes I feel less lonely. And I have this hypothesis that I feel less lonely because I'm including more parts of myself in that moment and welcoming more parts of myself. Um, and I'm seeing from one of the comments, uh, like an envy of, of me having parties to, to go to, I think um, I feel lucky for that, like having social connections. I think one of the big aspects of loneliness is not having found our people or not knowing how to interact with other folks. Um, I know when I was young, I spent most of my time reading science fiction and fantasy. Uh, like, and when I, see, when I say most of my time, I mean like on average, probably 10 to 12 hours a day. And I completely missed the whole couple of years where people are supposed to learn social skills, which is probably why I'm so interested in, in authentic relating. 
Um, but after that, I, I felt lonely a lot of the time because I didn't, I didn't have anything that approximated the kind of connection I got from books and the kind of worlds that I found there. So I guess that's what I think of when I, when I see that comment of like, it's, there is a form of loneliness of not having found your people or not knowing where your people are or not having invitations to them. Um, so one of the things, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about different ways of um, setting and changing context within social situations to possibly have more freedom to create deeper connection in a way that feels fulfilling. Um, and the question that I would love you to hold throughout that is this one of what do you want? And what are different ways to create that, including getting creative about it? So for instance, if what I want in a party is to run away, I th when I've really looked into that, something that I've discovered is I feel uncomfortable sometimes with very direct contact when I'm not um, when I'm not like dropped into it. When I first see people, I have such high anxiety that any more contact feels overwhelming. So I've been thinking, well, if that's my desire to have less direct forms of contact, what can I do to create that situation? And some thoughts I've had are I could learn guitar so that I'm the person providing entertainment and I get to sit a little bit on the outside and witness until I'm actually ready to step in. Or I can cook for other people and be the hostess, which is often what I've done, and use the excuse of doing dishes to be a little bit on the outside. Um, there's a beautiful story from Amanda Palmer, who's one of my favorite artists, uh, of going to a party and, and having had a, a concussion or gotten like a, a piece of stage equipment fell on her right before she got to the party. And she couldn't deal with the crowd of people, and so she hid in the closet and told people that they could come in one by one and talk to her and created this whole different social scene where she had these beautiful connections, um, you know, tens of them over the series of couple hours, but wasn't overstimulated. So one question is like, what are your, what are your social desires and how can you get creative about that? Um, and so, I want to talk a little bit about the different uh, the different frames of context that we're within. Um, when I say frame, I mean like uh, going to a party would be a frame. It's it's almost like the goggles through which we see. If I think I'm at a party, if my mindset is party, everything is based on that. Like maybe my assumption is I'm supposed to have fun, I'm supposed to talk to people, I'm supposed to dance, uh, whatever it is. Um, if I go to a meeting. I'm supposed to do work, I'm supposed to be prepared, I'm supposed to be professional. And if I'm not doing those things, then I'm outside the frame and often really uncomfortable. And if you start seeing these, you actually notice how often loneliness comes from not being able to meet other people or not being able to meet the frame that you expect yourself to be in. So I created a dorky diagram that I'm gonna to try to pull up to explain this for just a second. And this may or may not be, uh, Clear. Let me just open it real quick. Find it and then open it. Um, my partner uh, called this a Venn diagram that wants to be a flow chart. Um, hmm. that, I'm just going to share the one here. I can't find it fully. Okay. So, um, this is a bit of an outline of what I think social situations look like. So we have the meta frame, which is what I just talked about, which is what are we doing together? What are we, what's the agreed upon context? We're at a party, we're at a conference, we're in a meeting, whatever it is. Um, in fact, sometimes social situations can get awkward when we have different frames on what we're doing together. There's not a meta frame. I think we're going out for coffee for a friend hangout and you think it's a date. That can get kind of awkward. Um, and there's two possibilities in this. One is to play along with the meta frame and one is to assert yourself. So play along, you know, okay, we're, we're on a date together. 
cool. Let me like play along with what it's like to be on a date, even if I didn't expect it to be that. And the other one is to assert yourself. Imagine you're at a conference and the meta frame is like, you know, conferences supposed to be pretty professional, um, supposed to go along with the talks, uh, all the assumptions. Um, I've been at conferences where I wrote the word guru on a piece of paper, uh, went around to different groups at lunch, handed somebody the little guru sign, then just knelt in front of them and started asking them questions. So you can create your own game. Um, and authentic relating games are a lot of this. They're, they're kind of in the assert yourself um, space of how do you change the frame that we're in. Another example is um, in conversation. There's a norm of curiosity often going back and forth. And sometimes this leads to, I don't know when to ask questions. I don't know when to answer questions. Am I talking too much? Am I talking too little? You can change the meta frame by saying, I want to set a five minute timer or a 15 minute timer where I just get to know about you and your life. And I just get to ask questions. And then you don't have to even worry about whose turn is it to speak. Timers are magic, by the way. Um, so then within that meta frame, you have each of your frames. Your frame, what do I want? I think most of us, when we go into social situations are actually pretty unaware of this. And I think it's one of the main things that leads to loneliness. Because if I'm coming into a space and I don't know what I want, there's no way that I can get it. So being clear on what I want and then potentially even willing to be able to assert myself around it and speak up, even if it means I'm gonna leave the party for a while, gather myself, come back in, find connection um, for, I'm going on a retreat um, next week with uh, a bunch of my partner's friends. And I'm aware that I'm, I'm really scared about it because I don't speak the same social language that they do. And I often feel really lonely around them. So um, I talked with a friend and made up this whole list of things that I want to do in different situations. Um, like when I see them playing a card game, which is a thing that happens and having a conversation that doesn't interest me, uh, what are my options there? One option is that I can go in and play the card game with them and join the conversation, which is this kind of their frame. What do they want? Do I play along with that? Um, or I can go in, listen to the conversation for a couple minutes while playing cards, which is getting into their frame, and then bring up a topic and have a couple topics written ahead of time that really interest me. And maybe me asserting myself leads to a, a conversation and maybe it goes back to the norm that they were in. So there's another question of how many times do I want to try asserting myself? And how actively am I doing it? Because many of us that don't get what we want in social situations are maybe more passive communicators where we imply that we want things, but we don't always ask for it outright because it's kind of socially unacceptable to just say, hey, can we have a different style of conversation here? Um, it's, it's good to usually follow that up with a suggestion, but it's also a difficult thing to do. Um, so oftentimes we go into this space of being in someone else's frame and playing along but not deliberately choosing it, doing it because it feels like the only thing to do. Rather than, for instance, there's a way you can consciously choose to play along by deciding what you wanna get out of it. So I've decided that if I go into this social situation where I'm with my partner's friends and I can't change the conversation, then either I can leave or I'm gonna use it as an opportunity to try to understand their language and their mode of interaction. I'm gonna make it engaging to me by fulfilling my value on curiosity and learning. And that form of control uh, often has me feel more at choice and more comfortable and less lonely. I think often it's, it's feeling out of control and choiceless that's most lonely. And easy town, is when you meet someone and you have shared experiences and or shared values and or you're in the same subcultures and you're like, oh my God, this person is so easy to talk to. Why isn't everybody this nice? Might not be about them being that nice. It's probably that they share a lot of the same language and values. And if you have a lot of people to choose from, then you can pretty much hang out in easy town. But for many of us, um, we're in contact with people that don't share those same precepts a lot of the time, whether it's coworkers or family, or if you don't have a lot of social contacts, you're connecting with whoever you're in front of um, and you don't have as much 
you know, maybe as much possibility to find your people, so to speak. So that's my lovely Venn diagram that wants to be a flowchart. And, um, and some thoughts. And I am curious, seeing all that, if you want to um, maybe post some ideas in chat. This is kind of the brainstorming phase of the talk of in what ways would you want to find, would you want to uh, join other people's social contexts, bring your own desires in or change the frame in which you exist? And I'm gonna put these possibilities in chat uh, of, what this, of what this looks like. Just a second. Yeah, take a couple minutes to think about this. Um, saying the question, the question is, how could you imagine changing social situations that you feel lonely in, or even situations with yourself that you feel lonely in? By either bringing in, recognizing and bringing in more of your own desire, really choosing to join other people's desires, or changing the frame within which you're operating. And you can either change the frame by setting the frame initially, like you host the party, or by being within the frame and choosing to change it. There's kind of a spectrum between asserting your desire and changing the frame. Um, because I could just come in and say, hey, I want to have a different sort of conversation. And that is kind of changing the topic, which is a frame. Um, but you can also come in and say, I want to take everyone out to a restaurant, which is actually changing like the whole social sphere and environment. Mm. Great. So I'm just going to say some of these that I'm seeing and then maybe talk about some of them that seem like questions. Uh, ask curious questions, pay compliments that are specific, insightful, or comment on the situation with an interesting remark. I love that because that can be either that's kind of playing within someone else's frame, but bringing yourself in. And asking curious questions can sometimes actually change the frame of interaction. Um, an org being an organizer or planning of group activities such as a moving or a camping trip. One thing that I've really loved doing when I'm trying to join other people's frames is uh, there's a lot of the time that somebody asks a question or makes a comment that could be a question. Um, like, you know, how do you, how do you feel about the race riots going on right now? I can piggyback on that. Like maybe say they're asking it of one other person. Uh, then I can say, actually, I'm really curious how everyone feels about that. And it becomes a group conversation or one person appreciates someone else. Like if I'm, if I'm appreciating Brian, I might say, Hey, Brian, you know, I really love the, the, like, uh, you have your face like framed, like haloed right now by the light and by the beard. Um, and then someone else might say, I want to appreciate Brian too, or like, maybe we all give Brian a compliment, or maybe we give compliments to each other. So you can, you can continue a frame that you like. Um, so seeing a couple others, uh, as someone who feels very comfortable with changing the frame of social space, I love it when people who find it challenging, ask me for support. 
So one strategy can be to ask someone who is more comfortable to shift the frame for you. Beautiful. Yeah, having, having a good host for a party, for instance, um, like curating the people that are with you or curating who's facilitating it to be someone that has social acumen um, or having a wing person, these are all really good ways of, of being more comfortable changing a social sphere. So one thing to think about is like, what are, what are the places that you're most comfortable? Like who's with you? What's the physical environment? How have you prepared for it? And doing some of that work in advance. So you set yourself up to be less lonely when you're in a space. Uh, or for me, often it's thinking through in advance, having conversations with other people about why am I uncomfortable here? And what are things I can do to try something different? Um, and I also want to just note, I'm seeing some comments where it seems like people are comfortable changing the frame or setting frames and other people are really uncomfortable. And uh, from my own experience with anxiety, like I'm really aware of that freeze response where sometimes like I actually don't feel capable of changing the frame, even to the point of asking a question. I feel so frozen that I can't find my voice and speak. And I have to step out for a couple of minutes or I have to like go along with the frame and just really try to resource myself. And in those moments, having more strategies for how do I be with me are, are more valuable than how do I be with other people? Because in a way I'm getting stuck between me and them and I'm frozen in that mid space and I have to choose which of them I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to. Either I'm gonna get curious outside of myself or I'm gonna ground more in me, but I have to get myself out of that middle zone. Um, I'm seeing a comment of, uh, I get most fulfilled from synchronous easy town that I can flow in with ease. I need enough of easy town to energize me to be in other contexts. Yeah, that's really insightful. If we're always struggling, always trying, um, I imagine having kids is like this in a way, like you're always trying to relate with something that has a pretty different frame than you do. Sometimes you need to go and have some time by yourself. Like there's a, there's a rejuvenation of social energy. Um, where to some extent you have to be getting your own needs met. Uh, like I like to host parties for my partner who's really extroverted yet struggles to organize parties. I like cooking and getting the house ready for it. It's a beautiful example of how to weave in with someone else's superpowers. So um, I can continue uh, kind of reading and responding to these. That's, that's pretty much all of the um, content that I wanted to to give. I have like some more thoughts on just the different kind of languages that people seem to relate in that I can give if y'all want. But um, I'd love to actually hear if there are any questions y'all have. Um, I'm loving the thoughts. So definitely feel free to keep keep posting and we'll turn this into a bit more of a discussion Q&A. Please show the, the Venn diagram again. I wish I could, can I attach things here? I don't think I can. Okay, I'm just gonna screen share again. So kill time while people ask questions. The magical flow chart. And you can just screenshot this if you want. Oh, great. It sounds like Jennifer took a screenshot, so that'll get shared with everyone when we post the recording. But feel free to feast your eyes on the gorgeous diagram for now. You see its lovely colors. <laughs> All right. Stop screen sharing. You got to look at me again. Um, Okay, so seeing some questions. Um, so what to do in negative or stereotyping work environments uh, where you'd like to have a positive storytelling vibe like bus drivers? Um, let me think about that real quick. In terms of joining someone, so one thing about, about frames is that people respond best when you join their frame before asserting your own. So if you're in a situation with someone where 
you don't feel comfortable with how they're being and you've tried to kind of assert yourself or say, hey, I want to have a different conversation or can we talk about something else and, and it's not going over well, one thing that you can do is just start getting curious. Like, why do you think that? Like, can you tell me like a story about an experience you've had around this? Um, so just see if there's, if there's cu any curiosity you have about why the other person has the stereotypes they have, um, how it impacts them to have those, and see if you can do that from within their language. Um, so I like to start noticing the words that people are using um, and the ones they're not using. Like in some context, vulnerability is like a word that you shouldn't use because people don't respond well to it. It's like a sign of weakness. In other environments, it's a totally used word. So um, having a little bit of the same kind of way of being, vocal tone, using the same words can sometimes help you land better. People's frames don't just have to do with the words they say, they also have to do with the way that they're being and interacting. So that's something to pay attention to. Um, and another thing that you can do is uh, assert boundaries. Um, there's a there's a conflation often between rules and boundaries. Rules are things that you try to assert on other people and boundaries are what you say about yourself. So a rule would be, I don't want you to talk about, I don't want you to, to talk about those stereotypes anymore because I find those offensive. A boundary would be, if y'all are gonna have this conversation, then I'm actually gonna walk away because I'm personally not comfortable having that. But I'm totally comfortable talking about like why uh, like what experiences you've had with people that have led to those stereotypes. So often giving another alternative is really helpful because if you shut one thing down, you don't tell people how to move forward, they feel judged. Um, if you're new in town, how do you get invites? That's a great one. Uh, one is, so a couple, couple ideas with this. Um, I've had an experience recently actually of my, my brother is looking for a new job and place to live and has no leads. So there's a question of how to, how to find him places to go. Um, so one thing is start attending events that you have some contacts with, context with, uh, and ones where people actually interact. So yoga studios, for instance, people don't always tend to talk to a ton to each other except after class. So if you're comfortable initiating conversations, you totally can do that. Or you could do something where you're occupied if you're kind of anxious, I like doing things where I'm occupied with my hands, like a painting class or acro yoga jams are a thing I love to do because there's tons of interaction there, physical and often talking. Um, so attending events and just striking up conversations with people. Um, another one is find the connectors in your life and ask them to introduce you. So with my brother, uh, he asked me, uh, I put out a call and a couple other people started tagging folks like, hey, this person might have a job. Hey, this person might have a place to live. So personal introductions are a good way of doing that too. And the last thing is like, make yourself useful. This is a great thing for parties too. Like give yourself something to do. Uh, contact an organizer and say, hey, do you need any help with your event? Can I volunteer? Show up at Burning Man a month early to help build the temple. Like if you do things for other people, it gives you something uh, to engage you. And then it also gives you a natural excuse for being around other people and knowing what your role is. I think one of the main things that shows up in loneliness and disconnection is not knowing what our role is. Like, why am I here? Why am I at this party? What am I offering? What's my identity here? Am I like the entertainer? Am I the awkward person and the wallflower? Am I, you know, the host? Am I, for, for me, at least when I don't have an identity, I get really confused. And you can even assign yourself an identity ahead of time and play that out. Like come to a party with a certain interesting hat on that allows everyone to comment on it. Then you're the entertainment. Okay. A couple others. Um, my partner gets a lot of invites to parties. Uh, not so much now because of COVID. I often feel dread uh, if she asks me to go and yet a part of me wants to go. Um, Often my anxiety, worry, or just a sense of tiredness that I won't connect comes up and I avoid altogether. Any tips about getting to the event so I can join and be curious about others' frames? Um, yeah, a couple things that I do, and I wanna say, by the way, if y'all wanna comment on this, I'm coming from my particular set of frames and techniques that may be really different 
than what other people need. I think in a way giving talks like this is difficult because I'm giving a kind of a, these are the strategies that work, but they're the strategies that work for me based on my personality. Um, and I'm also trying to draw a little bit from the experiences of others that I, um, that I interact with because I've taught a lot, of, a lot of people and seen them interact. So um, one thing is to ask your partner for the type of support you need. Um, an example might be, I know that at events, I'm most uncomfortable in the first 10 to 15 minutes. So if I go with someone else, I might say, hey, can you just stick by me for the first 10 minutes? Like, even if you see a friend, like don't go off and kind of socialize right away. Just like, let like be next to me so that I can like engage in conversations with you um, and find safety that way. And that's part also of noticing what makes you comfortable and uncomfortable. Uh, so reflect some on like, what are the moments where you do feel comfortable in social situations? What are the um, factors in those environments? And then how can you, how can you make that happen more often? Um, another thing could be to give yourself a challenge, like challenge, stay an hour and see what happens. And if you know that you have to stay for an hour, um, that gives you freedom to, to interact in whatever way you want during that hour. Because part of anxiety is this being half in half out, like I've chosen it, but I've kind of also not chosen it. So find a way of making yourself choose it fully and then not choose it when you're done. You don't have to stay there right? Uh, and remove the obstacles to leaving. That's another thing is oftentimes I felt obligated to stay at events, um, either because another person's there that I know, I promised to be there, I don't have a way home. And I've discovered that it's honestly better for me to just call an Uber than it is for me to, to try to stick it out, like paying a little bit of money or having a little bit of social discomfort. And, but me knowing that I have that freedom is really valuable. That creates safety because we teach our bodies that it's unsafe when we don't give ourselves ways out. Um, cool. Um, yeah, if you have other questions, feel free to keep sharing them here. And I think since I have a little bit of extra time, I'm gonna talk about an idea that I've been playing with recently about the different ways that people, the different languages in which people interact. Because one of the reasons that we get into um, sticky situations with others, I think, is to not, uh, not know their primary form of communication. Usually whoever has the strongest frame in a group tends to dominate. Um, and that's like often the strongest personality or whoever set the frame, like the host, whoever has the most power. And I think there's a couple different ways that a couple different languages in which people interact as much as I've been playing it recently. Um, one is storytelling. And there's two forms of this. Uh, one is uh, the monologuer, which is someone that just kind of talks and talks and, and really their desire is to be heard, but they may need to talk for different amounts of time before they talk themselves out. And oftentimes they get really hurt when they're interrupted because it's in conflict with their value of being heard and understood. Um, the monologuer can sometimes be disconnected from their audience. Uh, so they might be trying to get something across, but they can't read your cues of whether you're interested or not. Um, and the other one is the bard. And the bard is trying to entertain by telling stories. They're the person at the party that maybe is the one that always like is pretty engaging with what they're saying. They are paying attention to their audience, but sometimes they can also become the center of attention, uh, whether or not they want that or you want it. So the storyteller, and if you have a, a strong storyteller in a group, the group kind of becomes about that. And you can join a storyteller by, you can tell stories back, you can get curious about their story, um, or you can directly, uh, you know, Sometimes you can be awkward and just say, hey, I'm loving your story. And I'm curious if there's anything you want to know about me. Kind of breaks the frame and inserts a new one. People will be uncomfortable for a second, but then sometimes you get more of what you want. Uh, another one is uh, the, the kind of questioner. And there's two forms of this, I think. One is the scientist and one is the mother. 
the scientists ask questions because they want to understand the world. And sometimes they can almost seem intrusive in it, like the person that kind of barrages you with questions. But they're really seeking to like get like, how is it that you work? How is it that other stuff works? And this is the frame in which I think a lot of these like are whether your attunement is more on yourself or more on the other person. Uh, and so the scientist often is, is maybe like a little bit more on their self and their own curiosity. And the mother is somebody that asks questions because they, they want to serve you. And sometimes this comes from a really genuine curiosity. And sometimes it comes from like uh, a desire to serve that's more on the other person. Um, the thing about the mother is if you have someone like this in your life, watch out for if they're always the one asking questions because they can sometimes get missed uh, in the fact that the attention never comes back to them. Because if I ask a question, the other person will almost always want to answer it. Uh, and there's actually a really funny thing I told, uh, I was telling some friends of mine in my community about this distinction. And we realized that a lot of people in my community, like nonviolent communication, authentic relating are scientists that have learned to look like mothers. So they really want to figure out about you, but they're going to ask you questions from a very open and concerned place. But really it's, it's fascination. Um, so I'll, uh, Monica, I saw your, your question. So I'm just going to finish this kind of pantheon and then I'll, they'll, then I'll answer it. So if this is useful to y'all, um, the types that I've talked about so far, are storyteller, questioner, um, a couple others. Uh, one is the joker. And this is kind of like a subtype, but I think for some people, this is a main, a main way that they relate is by making jokes, by bantering, by um, telling funny stories by even doing kind of physical comedy sometimes. And sometimes this can be from a place of connection. Like oftentimes jokers are really connectors. I, I talked to somebody about this a couple of weeks ago and she was like, yeah, I tell jokes because then they're the things that we return to. Like years later, um, people are still sending me cards about that joke that we had. And they form through lines. And other people do it almost as magicians to get the, get the attention off of them. Some people are jokers because there's an intensity of contact and they don't feel comfortable letting someone in so quickly uh, to their inner world. And for jokers, oftentimes being able to banter back a little bit is really helpful. And that's a learned skill for sure. It can be hard to banter back and forth. But if it seems like someone's lashing out at you, jokers can sometimes seem kind of intense or um, aggressive. Uh, they might not, they might actually be trying to form a connection. So taking it lightly, bantering back, and then asking a more serious question is one way of dealing with that. So it's a joker. Um, and then, give me a second if there were. Another one is the, like kind of the taskmaster. There are some people that are mostly task oriented and their conversations are mostly going to be about the things that they're doing. Um, and so connecting with them can be doing a task with them, doing a project, helping them with something. That's a really beautiful way of connecting. Let me remind myself real quickly of the last one, because I haven't actually taught this yet. Um, And I'm seeing some questions about the, the joker, like uh, joking to hide vulnerability and feeling safe before feeling trust and how to let people in when it can feel so intense in the moment. And again, I, I think maybe getting an idea of when it feels safe to let people in. Like, do you feel more comfortable when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone or when you're in a small group, when you've known them for a while? We have this, this precept that we should be vulnerable all of the time, but I don't actually think that's, I, I think that can be, painful sometimes to assume that we have to feel safe all the time. Vulnerability is a sign and a product of safety. So getting to a place with people where you do feel safe, knowing what feels safe, um, that's a place of kind of finding, finding more safeness, safety for vulnerability. And there's even things like, do you feel more safe inside your own home or other people's home when you control the situation or when you're joining other frames? So paying attention to these little things and taking some pressure off yourself. Um, can be helpful or just sitting back and watching for a while, letting yourself sink in instead of needing to put yourself forth. 
Um, so I think those are the main ones that I wanted to talk about. And I want to go back to Monica's question, which was how to do this during social distancing um, or physical distancing, as the case may be. Uh, all of these connection tools do work online as well as in person or even going for a walk with people. And one of the kind of cool things about the world we're in right now is everything's upended. And that also leaves more room to reinvent things. So you get the chance, like it's actually easier to find people right now because people often don't have as many things going on. So those people that you've wanted to hang out with, ask them for a one-on-one -on -one connection. They might be more likely to be free. Pay attention to like, do you enjoy having one-on-one -on -one connections or fewer physical connections? What is it like for you to connect online? And if you, you, you can use this space as, a, as really a space of experimentation to get really clear on like, what are the non-negotiables for you? Like for me, I realized that I don't need the degree of social network that I had before this, but I do need to have like three or four close people in my life that I have regular connections with, like same time every week, or we know we're gonna meet up every week. Before it was, we would bump into each other more often, but now it's like, I actually have to create that with them. Um, and I need some social times. And so I've tried to create that, like, you know, have my women's group start meeting online or, you know, go to outside gatherings where I'm staying apart from other people, but I can just like feel the presence of others around me. That in itself has often been enough or because I was more comfortable at coffee shops working than by myself, I'll do co-working sessions online. Um, and it may not be possible to get all the needs met right now. So part of my experiment has been like, what do I wanna learn while I'm alone? How do I sit with that? How do I manage things that I've been ignoring for years, like my mood swings, when it's more intense based on isolation? Yeah. And I think that is part of like the physical instead of social distancing of we're really connecting socially in new ways. Um, and the types I talked about are uh, storyteller, questioner, joker, and um, task oriented. I think there's a fifth one, but I can't remember it right now. <laughs> Served me right for teaching things that I didn't write down. Yeah, I'm loving these these gratitudes in chat. So that's about time. Um, thank you all so much for listening and participating. We're going to transition into a workshop where we get to play some authentic relating games to do this, um, to do this much more practically, uh, or not much more practically because I feel like this was fairly dynamic. So if you need to take a couple minutes break um, to go to the bathroom or stretch a little bit, feel free to do that. We'll start again at the top of the hour. If you want to share any thoughts or learnings you're taking away in chat, you're also welcome to do that.